Hey everyone, sorry about all of the back and forth. I uh, got a new machine set up and Megan was supposed to be streaming today, uh, but she's not feeling well. So I'm covering for her last minute and um, I hadn't had OBS set up on this machine yet. So I was trying to get that frantically set up. So thank you for bearing with me. How is everyone doing? And yes, we still will be talking about linear regression. It's not the exact same um, presentation that or live coding that uh, Megan was going to do, but it is still around um, machine learning and linear regression. So it should still be a good time. 2 a.m. in Sydney. Ah, good morning. <laughs> I think that instantly made me want to drink some more coffee. Is audio quality coming in okay? Again, I apologize. This is my first time streaming on this machine. But it's got the good RAM, so, and it's got the Ethernet cable, so it should be good. Awesome. Great. So we'll go ahead and get started soon here. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Guthels. Uh, I am on a <clears throat> team at Microsoft where we develop content and teach content at the Microsoft Reactors. And if you haven't heard of those before, um, basically we have these physical locations all around the world where we like to engage the community. We like to create a, a space for the community. Um, if you run a community meetup and you'd like to use our space, you can do that. Uh, and then we also develop our own content around topics that we've heard are of interest to our customers. So um, uh, we have been focusing on data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, we do some web development, etc. And uh, We've been piloting for the last month and a half or so these Twitch streams uh, because we wanted to make sure that even if we can't uh, go to all of the locations around the world right now, that we can still engage with you all today. So on Thursday mornings, morning's my time, uh, we typically do these two hour code with me, code and coffee, live stream, very relaxed and engaged um, kind of streaming. So I have the chat open on the side and uh, uh, we also have Christopher, my other teammate, uh, here in the chat, so Christopher can go say hi there. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ping us in the chat and either Christopher can answer them directly, uh, he's Geek Trainer, he just said hi, um, or uh, I can answer them during the stream. Uh, today what we're going to be doing is playing around with a data set on wine because there's an interesting thing about quality of wine and, and, and the components that make up a wine. And it is a very personal decision on whether you like it or not. I'm not a huge wine drinker, but I think the uh, just kind of complexity of the data that surrounds wine and whether or not it is good or good quality is interesting to me. Um, this is a uh, project that we're planning on running uh, in person when we are, go back to our physical locations. Uh, we're hoping to run this <clears throat> in a more collaborative uh, environment where we can work together and, and kind of look at all wines, look at white wines, red wines, etc. Um, and so I thought that I would start playing around with it here and see what you all think and uh, we can engage with it together. There's some things in here that are going to be new to me as well, so I thought that this would be a good opportunity to kind of push a little bit beyond my limits and start talking about how I would solve for these problems, uh, how I would grab, you know, look for docs or, or information and, and answer the questions that we have. So if you have a question or if I have a question and we don't know the answer to it, um, that's the purpose of this two-hour stream. Awesome. Uh, typically, I like to have my face in the corner so that you can kind of see what me was I'm doing things. Um, but because my bandwidth isn't always the best, I found it more useful to make sure that I can just show my screen when I'm coding. And then when I'm talking, I'll, I'll flip back to this. Um, typically, we have all of our notebooks available on our GitHub repo before we start. But again, this was a last minute swap. Uh, so after the stream, whatever we write in this notebook, I'm going to be putting in our GitHub repo. Uh, so I will um, 
uh, if Christopher, if you can link the repo in the chat, and then you know we'll continuously do that. Um, and yes, this will be recorded, published on YouTube, and that's the YouTube. Great. Hello from Brazil. Okay. So I'm going to switch over now and. Um, so this is VS Code. It is uh, free to install, free to download, works on Mac or PC. I'm on a PC today. And um, what I've done to set this up, and I know exactly what I did because again, this is a brand new machine. So uh, I, I know exactly what I did to make sure that this, this is set up. Uh, first of all, I, uh, installed Python on my machine. So you can see down here at the very bottom right corner, or sorry, left corner that I have Python installed. I also headed over to the extensions marketplace and I installed these four extensions. Uh, for the purposes of this stream, we don't actually need the Azure account and Azure Machine Learning Studio. I just always like to install those because once I do go into things like, oh, my audio is still gone. We have the uh, VS Code installed. We've got Python installed. We don't need the Azure account or Azure Machine Learning extensions installed. Um, I like to have them because when you do go to use the Azure Machine Learning SDK and connect up to um, doing some other things on the cloud, uh, you will, um, it'll be very, very useful. The only two things, or really the only thing you need is the Python extension. Um, and then when you install the Python extension, if you open up a um, file with an IPYNB ex uh, file extension, so a Jupyter Notebook file, basically, you will get an, a notice down here in the, in the bottom uh, right of your screen that says, hey, you haven't installed Jupyter. All you have to do is click that and it'll begin installing. Um, so it's fairly easy to set up. Just install Visual Studio Code, install Python, open up the Python. So install Visual Studio Code, install Python on your machine, uh, install the Python extension in Visual Studio Code, and then you can um, basically follow the steps from there. Will we need any additional packages? That's really just if you would like additional packages. Uh, so there is the Jupyter Notebook one that will uh, be you will be prompted to install. Um, but we will be installing some other things. Or we, for this stream, we do need some other things, and I will point those out. The last thing I want to mention is that when you do open a Jupyter Notebook file inside of VS Code, you want to make sure that you've got the kernel running and that it's set to the correct Python. So if it's up here and it has this green kind of connected and then it also says Python, you're good. Um, if for some reason it doesn't, you can do Control Shift P on Windows and Command Shift P on um, Mac. And then you can type Python, select interpreter to start Jupyter Notebook, and then you can choose the Python that you want. Okay, the data set we are going to use, yes, I will be posting that on the GitHub repo once this stream is over. All right, so in fact, let's go ahead and um, and bring that over right now. So I'm going to uh, open a file and this file that I'm going to open is the data that we want to use. So this is a CSV file of wine quality information. Um, so what we have here is a bunch of different factors in the wine. And again, I'm not a super, uh, I don't know a whole lot about wine. So um, just so you know, uh, this is all new to me as well. In addition to all of these different features of the wine, like sugar, chlorides, um, alcohol levels, pH, etc. There's also this quality column. Uh, and we're going to explore if we can essentially use the other columns, the other features of the wine to predict the quality of this wine depend, uh, based on this data set, which as you can see is fairly large. We've got five, 1,599 um, rows in this data set. Uh, this would be an interesting power uh, DI data set. Yeah. Um, how do you get it to load uh, and show into the bottom? So if you do Control-Shift-P, 
and you do Python, you should be able to, I mean, this one is selecting the interpreter for the Jupyter notebook. Um, I thought that there was another one to select just for, um, yep, so you can select the interpreter, show Python in the interactive window. Um, and when you open up a Python file, it should automatically kind of show up there. Oh, is it super fuzzy and hard to read? Let me try to also just make the, the font a little bit bigger. Whoa, that's not what I intended to do. <laughs> Sorry, that was the magnifier. Um, hopefully this will help a little bit. All right. And I'm just using uh, Python 3.8 because I this is a brand new machine. So I just installed Python brand new this morning. Um, but I believe this should work with, I think I've tried this with Python 3.6. Uh, it might also work with 2.7, but um, I think 3.6 was the last one I tried it with. Um, increase the streaming quality. I think this is what I have right now. I really apologize. Um, I was hoping that the ethernet cable would help. Um, but we also have this recorded and I'm recording that, oops, I'm recording that locally. So hopefully that'll also help because, uh, then the, the quality will be better. Yes. 2.7 is deprecated. I agree. You probably shouldn't use it. Um, I just, you know, if you only had that and you wanted to run things now. Okay. So, um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start installing all of uh, or sorry, importing all of the libraries that we're going to need. So uh, just for the purposes of this stream, I'm going to hide, basically ignore all of the warnings for right now. If there's an error, I obviously want to see it, but if there's a warning, eh, it's fine. Um, I just want to ignore it for now. And uh, again, all of this code will be on the um, uh, on the GitHub repo. So if you miss something or, or aren't following along exactly, um, know that it will be there. Uh, you do not have to install OBS to use, sorry, this is for, this is a VS code, not an OBS. And yes, you can use Azure Notebooks for this as well. Okay. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is something that someone earlier mentioned about what libraries um, uh, or packages we might need. So we're going to import a few. And so before doing this, you will have needed to um, do a, like a pip install of all of these packages. And actually, I forgot to run this. So let's actually run that. And... So that's funny. I think uh, I had like two instances open at one point, and then I deleted a. Um, a cell and I think that it it got all confused so let's try this again oh no what's going on <laughs> let me just try like doing it again uh... oh my gosh what is going on all of a sudden <laughs> okay you know what here let's not save that and let's um, open up a new file and we'll just save this as um, ml Sarah.ipynb. And you know what? Let's go ahead and save this um, onto the desktop for now. All right, let's try that again. There we go. Okay. So these are the packages that we want to import. So you would you will have had to do a pip install of numpy, pandas matplotlib, seaborn, and missing, miss, missing, no? I think it's missing number is, is what, what that's saying. But um, so these are the packages that you'll want to install. Uh, the, the NumPy, Pandas, matplotlib, and seaborn are fairly standard packages. Um, so we can take a look at what the missing no Python package, package. Um, is 
Um, basically, it's the it's a data visualization module for Python. So it's going to help us with some of our data visual visualization. Uh, uh, the the file called ML Sarah IPY and B on GitHub is not there yet. Uh, it will be after the stream. I'm sorry, I uh, didn't get a chance to do it before because I'm a last minute fill in. Okay, so we're going to make sure that all of these packages get imported. All right, so that worked. And if you if that didn't work you would have gotten an error saying that you were missing some package and then you could open up the terminal um, and you could do a pip install, uh, make sure that, um, yeah, you could do a pip install. If you're using like an Anaconda environment, making sure that making make sure that you have the Anaconda environment open there. Um, I didn't for this, for the purposes of this one. Okay, so now we've got some packages in there. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is configure the data visualization with some certain graph styles. Um, if you want to create one yourself, uh, then all you have to do is create a new file. So you can just go to File, New File, and then you just make sure that when you save it, so immediately do New File, it's going to open like this. It won't show the Jupyter Notebook environment. You're going to do a Control S, and when you save it, just make sure you save it as .ipynb. And when that, and you're not able to see my save window, sorry about that, but you'll you'll just add the .ipynb extension at the end, save it as plain text. And when you save it, it'll change to .ipynb and then Visual Studio will automatically recognize that and it'll load it in as a Jupyter Notebook file. For some reason, I'm getting this error. I'm not sure what's going on, but this seems to be working fine. So that's how you should be able to do it. And thanks, Christopher, that, that'll walk the folks through it. Great. So now we're going to configure the data visualization um, and set a couple of graph styles. And yeah, definitely, this, that's the whole point of this is, is for us to do it together. So happy to, to do it together. Um, I'm just taking some advice from some other folks on this. So I haven't personally explored this matplotlib style, 538. Um, but this was recommended to me for the type of data that we're going to do. So I encourage you to check out the different matplotlib styles uh, so that you can see uh, if there's other ones that you want to do. How do you start the Jupyter local server? So you just do control shift P. And then if you start typing Python colon select, it says select interpreter to start Jupyter server. And once you click that, it'll um, prompt you and ask you which Python you want. And then you can click on that and then that should start it. All right, so now we've got the vis data visualization styles. Ooh, there's an XKCD uh, style. I definitely wanna check that one out. Okay, another library that you are going to need or package that you are going to need is the scikit-learn. So we're going to import a bunch of the modules that we're going to use for classification for that next. So if you haven't already done a pip in install of sklearn, then you will need to do that as well. So as promised, we are going to be doing some linear regression. Um, here are the different modules uh, that we're going to install from scikit-learn. In this stream, we're going to not only do the linear regression, but we're also going to check out some different classifiers. Sorry, I forgot to get the other linear regression ones. So I'm gonna put all of those up on the screen. So quite a few different models that we're going to, to try out throughout the duration. Oh, and there's a couple more selection models. You know what, I think, yeah, there's selection, pre-processing, and then the evaluation. So there's going to be quite a few. And our last one is for our evaluation. Whew. 
quite a lot. <laughs> yes, happy to copy and paste this into the chat. This is quite a lot. Uh, hopefully that kind of worked. No, wait, I got an error message. Limit of 500 characters. Okay, so let's see where that stopped. That stopped on our um, uh, random forest regressor. Oops. There you are. Okay, so I'm going to start again from here. I'm just going to grab a few. And then we can grab these ones here. Uh, okay, that should be all of them. Uh, so when I uh, did a paste on the chat, it said 500 character limit reached and I pushed enter before I changed anything and that's how I, that's how I knew. Awesome. Okay. So what I would recommend uh, before you would kind of continue if you were doing this project on your own and, and, you know, once we post this up on the GitHub, if you're kind of exploring it, is I'd recommend actually taking a good amount of time to go through all these different models. Um, so one thing is that you can actually just hover over them inside of VS Code and uh, it'll bring up some, some documentation on it. So for example, this lo logistic regression classifier, it says that uh, in the multi-class case, the training algorithm uses the one VS REST OVR scheme if the multi-class option is set to OVR and uses the cross entropy loss if the multi-class option is set to multinomial. Um, so anyways, I'm not gonna read all of this, but basically it kind of gives you an overview of all of the models. It gives you, um, you know, all of the documentation for parameters. Um, and I think it does the, the C also's for anything that might be related to it, any notes and then also references. There's also some examples down at the bottom. So the like hover over and get this information is really useful inside of VS Code. But even if you didn't do that, you could just, um, you know, search on the web for the logistic regression model for scikit-learn and um, logistic regression, uh, you would be able to get the documentation that I'll paste in the chat now. And all of that documentation is basically the exact same that we just saw in that little pop-up. Okay. So I would recommend going through those um, and making sure that, that you know. So I'll go ahead and run this. Uh, if you've properly installed um, scikit-learn, sklearn, did a pip install of that, then you shouldn't get any errors. Okay, now it's time to actually read in our data set. So in order to do this, I actually want to make sure that I have it uh, in the right spot. So I'm going to grab I'm going to do a create a data frame. And if you are unfamiliar with data frames, we do have some videos that we've done in the past that are on our YouTube channel on pandas and numpy and all of that related to what we're about to do now with kind of like the data cleansing and such. So I won't go into too much detail for those. So I'm going to read in a CSV file of data wine quality. So let's go ahead and run that. And it worked. And again, that's our um, our CSV file, this one here. That's got all of us fixed, acidity, all of that. OK. Um, when I do post this on the GitHub repo, we will have a wine quality CSV file, but we will also, oh, right, you need the data. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and do that now, because uh, I want you to be able to follow along. So let me go up on GitHub and I will post the data now. And then Christopher, if you could be so kind to um, uh, approve my, my PR when I do this, please. Let me get you all of these data sets. Awesome. Okay. 
um, data for live stream. All right, so the data is being uploaded right now. Um, hopefully it won't take too long. Data for live stream, create pull request. And Christopher, uh, there is a new pull request 87. If you could please <laughs> um, go ahead and uh, approve that. These are the CSV files and they will be found in this folder once that is approved. And what we're up to is doing some basic machine learning on a wine data set. Okay, so yes, download that data. Um, once Christopher approves that for me, it'll be inside of that URL that I just uh, pasted there. So Re reactors online folder. Okay, so first of all, I mean, we can we can look at the CSV file, but the whole point of doing this in VS Code and not in Excel is that we can use code to take a look at what we're what we're dealing with here. So we can take a look at the shape of the data frame. So it's got 1,599 rows with 12 columns. I'm hoping to have some understanding of wine after this session too, to be honest. Um, this is a Jupyter Notebook inside of VS Code. All you need is the Python extension inside of VS Code, which is all free and available. Uh, we can also take a look at the first five rows and we can see that it's the same as, uh, or sorry, this is the first 20 rows. I'm used to doing the default of uh, head and that is five. Um, so we can take a look at the first 20 rows and we can see that this is the exact same data. So we've got 7.4, 7, I just kind of always like to do this gut check, to be honest, make sure that I'm looking at the right data. Um, 7.4, 0, 0.7, 0, 1.9, 0. 0.7076 looks correct. So we know that our data frame, DF, holds all of the data from our CSV file. Awesome. Next, we're going to start actually looking at the ver at the data. So again, quality is the is the um, variable that we want to be predicting here. Okay, we want to use all of these other columns to predict the quality. Great. So let's take a look at the columns that we have. And let's take a look at the information about all of the data that we have. So this will basically print out all of the columns and whether or not there are, so basically like what type they are and then whether or not there are nulls. So we can see that there are a total of 1599 entries and that there are, are a total of 1599 non-null values for each of our columns which is great. That means that we have no null values. It's important to do this first because um, uh, an end-to-end -end Python machine learning project viable within VS or VS Code, yes. And uh, I actually just recently did one. And the, the great thing is that if you did want to do some like cloud stuff, meaning that you wanted to connect up your machine learning um, to be able to run on a compute cluster in the cloud with with um, uh, Azure, for example, there is this Azure machine learning extension uh, that I that is you know you just have to install and you can actually connect it up to um, all of your subscriptions and um, you can see that you can have computes you can run experiments um, you can even create endpoints uh, you can create the models and deploy them. Uh, all within VS Code, but then also this can connect up to your um, your Azure subscription and you can do, you know, create some things in Azure, they'd be available to you here. Um, yes, it's pretty awesome. All right. 
Um, you do not have to install Anaconda before you select the Jupyter interpreter. Um, this is a brand new machine of mine, and I actually didn't install Anaconda. Um, so I know that for a fact. Uh, if you do install Anaconda, though, it can be easier because then you can just have everything that you need um, in order to, uh, to move forward. And yeah, let's check on that data. Uh, Christopher, if you're able to approve that pull request, um, I don't see the data yet. And I think it should be there. It should be a pull request at least. Yeah, three files changed. Cool. Um, thank you, Christopher. And so when it is merged, you'll be able to find three CSV files and they will be on, I'm getting you the link again now. The three CSV files will be here and the three are going to be the winequality.csv. And I will also be including a winequality-red.csv and a winequality-white.csv. So if you did wanna look at the data, um, you know, just on white wines, just on red wines, or on all of them combined, you can explore that. Okay, as I was saying, um, doing this df.info uh, is really important because this will help us identify if there are any rows with a lot of null values. And we cover that in some other videos, but um, if you have a lot of null values, it might mean we don't want to use that row to try to predict anything. Or it might mean that you want to do some cleaning of your data and manipulating of your data. So, uh, for example, if there are um, null values, but, you know, maybe it's like the temperature every single hour for, you know, for 30 days or something like that. And there's a few hours here and there that are missing from every single day. You could probably just assume that the temperature is about the same as the previous hour or two um, and fill in that data. Thank you, Christopher. Um, yeah, several Jupyter modules. So in the marketplace, what I would install is Python, and that's the one from Microsoft. And when you install the Python from Microsoft extension, um, all you have to do is open up a Jupyter Notebook file, and that will automatically prompt a notification down here in the bottom right that'll say, hey, you need Jupyter installed. Do you want to do that now? And all you have to do is click yes. Awesome. All right, so we're lucky. We have no non, we have, I was gonna say no non-null. <laughs> we have no null values and we can triple check that. Again, this is um, just another way of viewing to see if we have any null values. So we can look through the entire data frame, check if something is null, add those up, and we can see that for each of these columns, we have zero null values. And finally, just because we did install that other package, we can look at this in a um, visual way. Not super interesting because we have zero null values, <laughs> um, but we could have looked at this in, 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 a, in a visual way as well um, to see any of the null values. All right. So what we've done so far is basically just install, or sorry, uh, bring in our data set as a data frame. We've well, imported all of the, the modules that we needed. We brought in our data set as a data frame. We took a look at the shape. We took a look at the first few rows. Uh, we made sure that we knew what the columns were. We made sure that we didn't have any null values. And that's where we are so far. Okay. Um, the next thing that's really useful is to describe the data frame. And the reason why this is useful is because it'll start to give us some information that'll be really hard to gather from here. So for example, it looks like a lot of the, um, the uh, quality numbers are like five, six, seven, but like I, I have no clue what the quality <laughs> uh, number range is. So doing something like DF describe will help give us that information. So for example, we can see, and let me just get rid of this. Uh, for example, we can see that we've got the minimum and maximum value of each column. And this will be really useful to, to help us like actually understand what we're looking at. 
So for example, in quality, the minimum value is three and the maximum value is eight. How do you download the CSV files? That's not a stupid question. There are no stupid questions and doing so on GitHub is actually not very trivial if you don't clone the entire repo. But uh, one way that you can do it is you can take a look at um, the uh, raw file. Um, and if you, so the way I got there was, and actually let me just see if I can do this super, super quickly. Um, the way that I got there was, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try something, bear with me. Um, and that is the one I want, okay. So I think you should be able to see this now. Yes, awesome. So the way that I got there is I went into the Reactors um, GitHub repo. I clicked online. I found the CSV file I wanted. And this is not actually very trivial. So uh, I did raw here. And then I did right click and save as. And then you can save it as um, a CSV file on your local machine. Uh, alternatively, you could clone the entire repo, um, but you know, there's a lot of other stuff that <laughs> maybe we don't need right now. Awesome. All right. So we can hide that window for now. Okay. Where are we? Let's bring this back up. So we can see that our quality ranges anywhere between three and eight. And yeah, we only need the single file right now. Um, but there are the two other files, the red and white, if you if you want to check those out. OK. So um, the next thing we're going to do is explore the data in some other ways. Uh, we're going to be using the facet grid class next. And this helps us visualize the distribution of a single variable as well as the relationship between multiple variables. Um, so we can look at this in kind of like a multi-dimensional way. So let's take a look at this. So this is the factor plot. And we're using Seaborn for this. So let's go ahead and run that. And so this allows us to see um, just the single uh, um, features or columns of each of these and kind of what those ranges are. So we can see, for example, the quality, the range is extremely small. It's only between three and eight, but it looks like our sulfur, sulfur dioxide um, is uh, very variable. I don't really know what sulfur dioxide does with wine, um, but that's part of this whole thing is kind of just exploring it and figuring this out. And yeah, unfortunately, this notebook isn't in the repo yet, but it will be at the end of this, um, this stream. All right. Uh, so we can actually plot the wine features in individual histograms as well. And so this is going to be like a, a big block of code, but let's walk through it together. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to basically want to create a figure with a certain set of axes. axes. Um, that plural word is hard to say. Uh, so we're first going to do that. And basically, we want to have um, all of the columns represented here. So these are the columns. We know that from uh, you know looking at the data. We, we did the dot columns, everything like that. Um, and basically, what we're trying to do is we want to show all of these uh, individual columns as a histogram to show the variation for each of these features, OK? So what we're going to do next is um, basically what this is doing is creating like a five by five grid of, of graphs. You'll see it in the end. <laughs> so we're going to do a nested for loop to fill in this five by five grid of graphs. So we're basically going to create a histogram where X is a certain column. Um, uh, yeah, a certain column uh, from the data frame. And then this is just kind of giving some 
some visual aids here. And then we're going to set the title to that column name. Well, variation of that column name. Is there a shortcut for auto-completing all columns? You know, I don't think that there is. Uh, not for this, because this is, we're really just creating a list of those strings. And the purpose of that is um, to match the data frame column names, but then also here. Um, we do have this up here, df.columns, and you could totally just run that and then grab this, and then it would be the same. So kind of a shortcut. Uh, df.columns is what gives you that. Yeah, always best to, to get that information from code rather than type it out to avoid uh, to avoid any kind of typos. Okay, and then basically we're just gonna graph graph <laughs> graph this out. <laughs> And again, uh, we're not going to go into all of the details on, on how to use all of these different modules and libraries, but definitely um, uh, definitely take the time after this to, to dive deeper into those docs. Is ML.NET up to par compared to what Python provides? So I have heard yes. I have not personally gotten a chance to explore ML.NET yet, but I'm really excited to because the folks um, on, our, on our sister teams, they've been doing it a lot and they've been like showing me all of the really impressive stuff they've been doing and I really want to try it out. So I can't for 100% say, um, but I want to say yes. Yay, I'm glad it seems to be working now. Awesome. Perfect. So now we've got all of our graphs and we can see the same kind of information that we saw up here, but in this histogram style. And this allows us to get all of them. So by creating this figure um, of all of these things that allowed us to get all of them all in one. Again, since I am not a wine connoisseur, um, I'm not 100% sure what each of these like mean in the sense of like, what does residual sugar do to wine, etc. But that's part of what we're going to discover here. Um, so I'm kind of trusting my SME in wine, the person who's telling me, hey, this is important, you should check it out. Um, and I'm just kind of doing a data exploration at this point. What I would do if I was on like a real data science team at like a winery, a vineyard, something, whoever thinks about the composition of wine, um, what I would do is actually talk, start talking to the SME on wine and SME is subject matter expert. Um, I didn't know that up until like a year ago. Um, so I would talk to the subject matter expert, AKA the person who knows about wine composition. And I would show them this and I would say, hey, you know, this is what my data has so far. Um, do you see anything that we should particularly look into that looks strange, that is particularly interesting? Um, and I would have a conversation with them about that. This might also be something where they might say, you know, I'm really surprised that we don't have a whole lot of sugar here. I don't, again, I'm not 100% sure on this, what this means, but like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm surprised that we don't have that because, um, you know, I don't know, because of, of, of reasons. I thought my wine did have that. Maybe my, our data is wrong. Maybe we're missing something. All right. So now we're going to uh, start showing the correlation between variables. OK, so we're going to look at um, the correlation between two variables and each cell is going to show us this. So we're going to basically create a correlation matrix. Matrix. All right. Um, so this is, again, just some Basically, we're going to create a correlation matrix of our data frame and be able to see our data in a, in a different kind of way. So this is comparing every column to every other column and showing where there might be a correlation. Yeah, the um, docs do recommend, the Visual Studio Code docs for Python do recommend that you install Anaconda. It isn't a requirement, but yes, they do recommend that. And yes, you can definitely do a pip install instead. 
Okay, so what can we start to infer about our data based on this correlation matrix? Um, it looks like if, again, what we kind of care about is quality here. So if we look at quality compared to all of the other um, columns, we can see that the volatile acidity uh, is one of our low, like has our largest lowest number <laughs> of correlation here. So there's something going on with that. It's point, negative 0 0.39. So that might be something that we want to take a look at. Um, the quality of the wine is also highly correlated to alcohol, which probably makes sense. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> and yes, the pH and the citric acid um, slash fixed acidity are highly inversely related. So if we look at fixed acidity and citric acid um compared to each other so where's sorry where's my it's much harder when we're in this larger graph so citric acid compared to where's my citric acid compared to where am i i just got lost ph and citric acid ph here we go the negative 0.54 and pH and fixed acidity. So we have a high negative correlation there. And of course, we've got the ones on the side because you get a one-to-one -one correlation of quality to quality. Again, here is where I might bring in our subject matter expert, our SME on wine, and have them make sure that there's nothing else that's like missing. What I mean by missing is if as a non-wine person, I might look at this and start to infer things. Um, as a wine knowledgeable person, I might look at this and start to say, hey, I think that that's wrong or I'm surprised by this data. Maybe there's actually something that's wrong with my data. And so that's why this kind of data exploration is really important before you start to do anything. And preferably you're working with people who are like subject matter experts um, on the uh, – on the data, so then that way you can have these conversations. Correct, just because pH has a correlation with acidity, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it will relate to quality. We're going to be exploring whether or not these actually are related. So the first thing that you typically want to do though is remove highly correlated variables because um, that will have too much data that will that will cause an overfitting of our model. So yeah, if anything is missing, the neural network just needs more training. Yeah, if anything is, that can be true, but it might also just be that your data set is incomplete or something like that. So remember, like when we're in a learning capacity, yes, typically the data is something that is like true. But in the real world, if they're grabbing wine and they're doing some kind of, um, you know, I don't know the technical term, um, but for example, my husband, he is a bioinformatics scientist. So they take proteins and then they run them through mass spectrometers um, and then they gather the features of the proteins. That is not a clean process. That is not like a, yes, this is 100% true process. There's going to be incorrect data in that um, output from that mass spectrometer. And I'd imagine it's similar in wine quality where you might have the wrong or incomplete data. So it may be something that is wrong with the models that you're running or anything like that. But this is the step where we're going to actually test to see if it's wrong with like the data itself. So we'd like to not overfit our model, meaning um, if we have very highly correlated variables, that might cause problems because then it's going to have like basically two things that say yes when it should only be one thing that says yes because the two things are basically the same thing. It's like my super non-technical way of explaining that. So before we get into that, what we really care about here is quality. 
right? So we really want to compare the quality variable um, to the other features in the data set. So let's start finding some interesting relationships with that before we start just kind of totally taking everything out. So the first thing that we're going to do is get ready to show the relationships between um, quality and fixed acidity. That's the one we're going to choose first in a bunch of different ways. OK, so we're going to create a bar graph of. I think I might be back. Awesome. OK, um, so we've created a function called plot that takes in um, a certain feature like fixed acidity. It's going to target quality. Um, so it can you can change the target if you want. We did um, make the default quality, but we also added it here. Eh. Um, and then we're just going to basically create a factor plot. Um, we're going to use factor plot, excuse me, to create a bar, violin, and swarm plot. So let's go ahead and do that. All right. This is super interesting because if you were to look at, for example, like these graphs here, um, this bar graph, I would say that they, you know, I do see that um, uh, that they're different here when you go from quality three and quality eight, um, but I don't get the same view as I do down here with the swarm plot, where we can see a lot more um, uh, relationship between fixed acidity and quality here. So that's kind of interesting. Or is it that there's only that many threes? It might be actually that there's only that many threes. Now I can't remember. But we can see, I, I just love the different representations here of how accurately fixed acidity relates to quality, um, depending on the quality uh, uh, value. And then you can also see these kind of like bumps in when they do, um, like this uh, violin graph it's called. You can see these bigger bumps here towards the seven, seven and a half um, fixed acidity value on four, five, and six, five and six particularly, um, where I can kind of see that here, but it almost looks the same. And that's because we are doing kind of this overlay of the swarm. So it's hard to really see on these edges how many there are there. And so basically what this is showing is for every single row, what is the quality and what is its uh, fixed acidity for that same row. And then it's just basically plotting those. Um, we can also check out the uh, same type of comparison between alcohol and quality. I don't know. I don't know which one do you all think is is a better visualization for this. I kind of like this um, violin. Interesting. So I that might be normal um, to get those warnings. Uh, remember at the very beginning, I just I just hid all of my warnings so I couldn't be bothered. Um, uh, I'm not actually sure. Uh, maybe it is cat plot instead. I'll take a look at that after the stream. Yeah, I like the violin one as well. I feel like it gives me the best visualization, at least the way my brain works, of understanding what's going on. Like this swarm graph is interesting, but I think what's hard for me is these overlays here on the edges. It's hard for me to really see these kind of little, little fat parts. <laughs> so you can see like with alcohol at the quality five, we've got that bigger fat part at the uh, nine and a half alcohol rate value. Um, versus with fixed acidity we had it kind of at the five four five and six 
But these swarm graphs for fixed acidity compared to the swarm graph for alcohol look very similar. So I feel like with the swarm graph, I wouldn't have been able to see that. Um, yeah, you should be able to tailor the like borders and such. Um, I'm not going to go into that completely, but you can look up the documentation for Seaborn for the factor plot. And um, yeah, there's a lot that you can tailor with the with the actual visualization pieces. So what we're seeing here is um, uh, that it looks like the alcohol count for like a quality five is likely to be around eight or sorry, nine and a half. I don't know why I put eight between nine and ten. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing here is that is is the difference. And, and, and we can also see that like a, a quality eight wine has a good distribution of alcohol meaning you don't have to have an alcohol count of 14 and a half or 15 to have a good wine um you know generally speaking it's probably around 12 but there are good wines or great wines that are lower as well yeah actually um why not just taste the wine there was um uh it's kind of interesting because wine is literally just a personal <laughs> preference. Um, depending on how you taste sweet versus sour or, um, uh, you know, savory or acidity and things like that, depending on your literal tongue and how you taste, uh, the wine is going to be good or bad, right? So this is, we, we can't know that for every person. Um, so what we can do with wine, and again, I am not a wine connoisseur, but what we can do with wine is start to explore um, what the features of the wine, like the composition of the wine, like alcohol, fixed acidity, all this, that we can measure how that relates to what people are saying is a quality versus not quality wine. Um, and then that'll at least give us some indication. But yeah, it is 100% a, a personal taste for sure. Awesome. Okay, so now we've explored the data. Now let's actually go into creating some models. We're at the one hour mark. I think it's, I think we're ready. I think we're ready to actually do this. Um, okay. So in this first section of like creating and running models, we're going to configure nine regression models all at once. And then we're going to compare those and see which one has the most accurate results. Okay. So we're basically going to create, we're basically going to kind of split our data into bad and good. Okay, so remember we've got three, it goes from, our quality goes from three to eight. Anything like above a 6.5 is going to be good and anything below a, a 6.5 is going to be bad. Okay, and then we're going to, um, I'm actually not sure what this, uh, what this does. So in our scikit-learn pre-processing, um, basically we're going to do a label encoder. And, oh, okay. So basically we're, uh, we're going to use that um, to enc encode target labels between 0 and n minus 1. Um, so my understanding of that, this is new t newer to me, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, basically transforming non-numerical labels into numerical labels so that we can start to, to do this more mathematically. And then, yeah, basically we're going to um, take our label quality, so our label encoder, and we're going to fit our quality, um, so that's three through eight value, uh, to our label encoder, and we're going to replace 
the value in our data frame with that value. Basically, what we're doing is we're just say, taking anything that was a five and making it a zero, so bad, and anything that was an eight and making it a one, so good. Again, we're using this 6.5 as the, as the delineation point for that. Okay. So now we're actually going to train, like split our data and train all of the models. Okay, so um, again, we've done some previous videos on this, but uh, we're gonna use the train test split function, um, which is just kind of like one of the fastest and most accurate ways to do this. Basically, we're, tr we're splitting our data between training data and testing data, where Y train and Y test, so our Y value is going to be our quality. It's the thing that we're trying to predict. And the X value is everything except for our quality. Okay, so we're going to drop our quality column from our data frame, and that's going to be our X values the entire data frame without quality. And then we're going to have our quality be our Y values, okay? And then we're going to set our test size to 25% and we're gonna do a random state of 42. So what this is going to do is it's going to split our data. 75% of the data is going to be training data and 25% of our data is going to be testing data. The reason we wanna reserve some of that 25% of our data as testing data is we wanna use the training data to train our model and then the testing data to test our model. Now, I know I didn't really say anything new. I actually just came up with this analogy the other day. If, if you're new to this, <laughs> um, think of your training data like a pretest or like a practice test when, when you were in school or, or anything, anywhere when you ever had to take a test. You might have been given a practice test. The practice test is pretty much the questions that are going to be asked on the test except for they're not exactly the same questions. And so you'll do all of the practice tests in order to um, uh, uh, practice or train your brain to take the real test. And then you will do the take the actual test. Um, and then what you will do is get your test graded. And so the practice test is the X train um, and the practice test answers is the Y train, okay? And then the test is the X test. And then the teacher's key to that test or answer to that test is the Y test. And so this will allow us to actually evaluate whether or not we, we've been doing this, okay? You can't overfit in real life. Yeah, true. Well, I mean, you could overfit in real life if you took the exact exam memorized the answers, and then took the exam again and got 100%, you wouldn't actually have learned anything. And I would consider that overfitting in terms of education. <laughs> OK, so um, yep, basically, uh, we've split all of our data. And then we're going to run it through. So if you remember way up at the top, um, we imported all of these modules from Scikit-Learn, all of these different models that we're, we were going to run it through. And so basically, that's what we're going to do now. And this is going to be one of those that I will probably go ahead and paste into the chat. So let me grab it for you, just because it's uh, just a lot of like copying of, of those model names. So I'll put it here first in case you do want to write it out. Um, so we are creating a list of the actual models. We're going to call logistic regression model, linear CVS, sorry, SVC, <laughs> um, K nearest neighbors, random forest classifier, the decision tree classifier, the gradient boosting classifier, um, the, I can never pronounce this, Gaussian, gosh, um, why do we have three bins and only two labels? So basically, it's it's kind of the uh, um, uh, the bins are the what's like the uh, starting and ending for each of them, right? So you're always going to have plus one bins than you have classifiers or uh, encoders. Okay, 
You know, a funny thing about 42 is, thank you for checking my pronunciation. A funny thing about 42 is um, I knew that that was like, you know, the answer to the universe. I knew the the book reference, but <laughs> I was like, does it actually have a pro like a programmatic mathematical reason why we use it in um, in random number uh, seeds? So Christopher and I had a discussion about that because he was like, no, it's just 42. And I'm like, yeah, but is there something? Um, anyways, you could use anything else. Oh, interesting. So they do do better on that, on um, on a split 42. Interesting. All right. So we've created our list of models with those model names. OK, well, I'm going to check out the the 42 stuff then. All right, and what we're going to do next is we're going to um, grab the, basically, we're going to be creating, uh, we're, we're actually going to run these, and uh, we're going to store all of the information about it, okay? So, for each model, in our list of models up here. We're going to um, run, we're going to grab that model. So this is an actual uh, function, right? So algorithm. So we're going to grab that model. We're going to fit our X train and Y train. So fit our training data to that model. Then we're going to try to predict using our X test. And yeah, SNS is Seaborn. Thank you. And then we're going to um, append to this accuracy list the accuracy score. So we're going to grab the score from the prediction to the actual answer key, right? The Y test. And then we're basically going to print out for each of these the model name with this accuracy. All right. And yeah, doing like SNS for Seaborn and, and PD for Pandas is, is fairly common. Yeah, so accuracy for metric, would other metrics work too? Um, in this case, yeah, I, I want to know how accurate uh, my prediction is because what I'm trying to do is say, if I were to give you all of these columns minus the quality, could you tell me what the quality is with a certain level of accuracy? Oh, is it really? SNS is the initials. I love all of these tidbits. <laughs> I hope I hope not. I really want to know that now. Um, yeah, so up here we did like NumPy as NP, Pandas as PD, uh, Matplotlib, the PyPlot as PLT, um, Matplotlib as, um, oh, no, that was just importing style. Um, Seaborn as SNS and the missing no as MSNO. Sam Seaborn, interesting. You know, I've never actually seen the West Wing. I've heard it's amazing. All right, so let's go ahead and run these and see what we get out of it. All right, so we can see logistic regression is 0.875. Our linear is 0 0.877, 0 0.87. So they're all pretty similar. And it looks like the fourth to last one, our random forest classifier looks like to be the most accurate with 90.5% accuracy. And they're all pretty high accuracy. That's awesome. So let's actually visualize this. Um, let's put this into a data frame. Oops. Just make it easier for us to see. And also then we can do things, data framey things to it. And let's do a bar plat. A, gosh, my words today. A bar plot of um, the accuracy. Again, part of this whole thing is just actually being able to um, visualize it and understand it in ways that make sense to humans, right? We don't want to just assume that these are right and just keep going. We, we definitely want to... Um, so the, the curly braces is basically like a, uh, um, 
I'm going to say this wrong. Um, I want to make sure this is right. And maybe Christopher knows better than me. But isn't the curly braces basically like creating like a list of lists? <laughs> is that right? A dictionary? Yeah. Oh, dictionary. Thank you. I couldn't remember for some reason. My brain totally blanked on that. Which, yeah, duh. That's how you create a dictionary. Anyways, okay. Yep. The joys of live coding, like the simplest questions, you're like, uh, <laughs> what's a dictionary again? Yes, dictionary, hash tables. So the difference, if you don't know, um, uh, dictionary basically means that you've got a, um, a key and then a value, right? So we've got the, these are all of our keys. Logistic regression is a key. And then the value for that is 0.875 versus the list, which is just the list of the values. Okay. Awesome. Um, let's also look at this in a point plot. So basically, um, just kind of like another way to, to take a look at this. So we're still going to, it's kind of the same thing here, except, um, we want this to be a point plot. Um, and, uh, this is giving some of those sizes and things that you can play around with. So yeah, again, our random forest classifier seems to be the most accurate here. So now we're going to jump into some feature scaling. Okay, and this is getting towards the uh, um, outer limits of, of my expertise. I have been playing around with this for quite a while, um, but the, I'm not an expert expert yet. So we're going to be learning this a little bit together. Yeah, I agree. I think the bar chart makes more sense here. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of different ways of visualizing it, depending on what you're trying to, to figure out. So feature scaling is essentially a method used to normalize the range of independent variables or features of the data. Um, so typically, this is performed during the data pre-processing step. Um, and we know that the range of values varies widely. So for some machine learning algorithms, objective functions will not work properly without normalization, right? So if we go back to um, looking at some of our variables up here, we can see that some of them have a wide variety. Um, you can go, you know, yeah, there's a wide variety. I don't need to explain that further. And so if we normalize it, then that'll give us a better accurate description, um, or sorry, that'll allow the model to more accurately uh, predict, oops, um, predict the quality, basically. This would allow each feature to contribute approximately, proportionally, proportionately, <laughs> To the final distance. So we just because one of our variables might have a bigger variance doesn't necessarily mean we want it to have more impact on what we're predicting. Yeah, I don't think that there's a logic for connecting these either. I think it's just a, a showing you that you can we can just like look at it in different ways. I agree. There's no logic in actually connecting these up. Okay, <clears throat> so this is another gonna, this is going to be another um, kind of larger bit here. Oops. Let me make sure my, oh. I meant to do this one. Okay, so we're gonna define a function here that's going to take in our X training data, or basically our training data and our testing data and a name scalar. And um, what it's going to do is it's going to get all of our functions again. Uh, it wants to grab our accuracy score. It's going to run all of our um, data through our machine learning algorithms <laughs> and append that accuracy score to that. Um, and sorry, I'm missing something here. 
I not missing a... Okay. Oh no, sorry. That's my brain ignored the tab. Um, so I I was like, where where are we defining this? But it's being defined as the parameter. Okay. Um, okay. So we're gonna define this function that we're going to use next. So right now, as a reminder. Our accuracy data frame is this. So as a reminder, this is what we did above, OK? We haven't changed anything yet. So our accuracy data frame that we created here based off of the dictionary that we got out of running it originally. Um, sorry, hang on one second. I think I have an error somewhere and I want to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, cause then we don't actually, where, why are we not actually calling this feature scaling? Okay, so I think what we need to do next is call um, this. Sorry, I'm just testing something out because I think I messed. Ooh, what did I just do wrong here? Sorry, y'all. I got confused and I think there was an error, so I want to make sure it's. Oh, Lord. OK, so I think um, what we want to do is, yeah, use the standard scaler. Um, so yeah, this was missing something. So I'm going to try this out. Uh, sorry about that. Ah, where am I? Where are you guys? I can't find the chat anymore. Here it is. OK, um, so this was actually missing the actual call to this. So let me. Um, let's actually call this and we want to use, let's try using the, um, standard scalar from scikit-learn. So we should be able to do standard scalar and then we should be able to rerun this and see the differences here. Yeah. Oh, Lordy. What did I do wrong? Could have non. Oh, gosh, there's some blank characters in here. All right, I feel like I totally just got screwed up here. Did I accidentally like miss something here? Where am I? I think I'm I accidentally like deleted a um uh, the joys of doing this live. I think I accidentally deleted a cell and I'm missing the actual call to doing this. So that's fun. <sighs> Check this out. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Yep, I think we just forgot to actually call this. So um, accuracy score. Because what we wanted to do was actually include each of these scalars, which, by the way, um, basically is the scikit-learn pre-processing 
uh, stuff that we're doing. So let me find that one for you as well. Um, so let me show you that on OBS, just so then that way we're not totally, you're not totally just listening to me. So um, yeah, basically <clears throat> using uh, the we can, the pre-processing, aha, the pre-processing has a number of different scalers that you can use. So there's the standard scalar here, um, removing the mean and scaling to unit variance. Find scale. Um, and then there's also, for example, um, one of the other ones that we were taking a look at were the uh, min and max scales here. So there's a the max absolute value. There's the min and max. So scale each feature to the negative one to one range without break breaking the sparsity, transforming features by scaling each feature to a given range. There's a robust scale, um, et cetera. Um, there's also, uh, yeah, transforming by scaling. Yeah. Um, so this is the in the pre-processing and normalization one. So I'll plop that in here. But I don't know why this didn't work. So we should be able to send in the standard scalar to the function that should add to the accuracy data frame uh, a new column with that um, accuracy after it's been scaled, right? So basically we are, are scaling it first and then doing that, which we're not scaling it first. There's something wrong with this. Um, Yeah, we didn't actually scale this first. Is that what's coming up next? Did I just get ahead of myself? Yep, I just realized like I had like a total error in here. So now let me let me show VS Code again. I told y'all this was like the the edge of my of my expertise, and so we're gonna figure this out together. Um, so yeah, basically what we should be doing is uh, looking at the we want to be looking at the scaled accuracies now, not just the actual run of this. And um, the issue that I am seeing is that we're not actually in our code here. We're not actually scaling any of our of our data. We're 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 creating this new. Um, column here, but we're not actually scaling. This is the exact same code that we ran above. Accuracy score, Y test. Okay. I'm just, I'm just reading through it like 500 times to make sure I'm not missing something obvious here. Um, so let's take a look at scaling data um, uh, before running through models. So actually, let's take a look at scikit-learn's examples. OK, so let me show off my, and this is going to look all funky again. OK, let's make this a little bit shorter so that you can see everything I'm doing. OK, um, so here's an example of actually using the standard scalar. So we create the scalar and then we, we call fit to that scalar. So that's what, what it seems like we're not actually doing is we're not actually fitting to the scalar. We're fitting, we're still just fitting to the model <clears throat> first. So <clears throat> um, we need to fit the data to the scalar and then we need to, um, I'm sorry, this is probably like really tiny text. Let me make this bigger. Okay. So basically we want to scale the data, scalar.fit. So create a scalar, scalar.fit. Compute the mean and standard to be used later for scaling. Uh, fit the data, then transform it. I think we want to fit and transform. I mean, we could do fit um, and then do scalar.transform, but I think we actually want to fit and then transform. So I think if we do that instead, then we can run this through again. So what we're going to do is, and I'm not positive on this, but I think what we need to be doing before we run this 
is we need to be doing x train scale equals name scalar dot fit transform x train. I think this is what we need to be doing. So I'm going to run this. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll rerun this where we're going to be sending in the scalar. Okay, so let's rerun this to redefine the function. Let's call this scale func. Okay, I think this is correct. Don't need to do that again. Let's run scale func. Nope, that isn't how you're supposed to do it. Oh, let me take a look at the docs again. Self x, y, sorry. So self x. Repeat the name. Ugh. Oh, we just transformed for the act for the test but the um yeah i'm not sending in all the parameters i didn't even look at that so x is the um returns x new yeah that's what i thought so it should take in x a numpy array of shape and samples and features numpy array of shape Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so then the transform one. I see what you're saying. Okay, so what you're saying is here, <laughs> we need to do this. And here we need to do this. Well, I am Failing at this. It's okay though. Data frame has no attribute fit. Sorry, where was that error? On self dot fit x dot transform. X train y train x test. Name scalar fit transform. So it's not able to fit the X data because it's not, I thought that it was. Hmm. So fit transform, fit to data, then transform it. Fit to data, then transform it. Um, fits transformer, and sorry, you probably aren't, you're not able to see this. Fits transformer to X and Y with optional parameters, fit params, and returns transform version of X. X and Y. Um, I don't think I need to do that because the name scalar equals standard scalar um, and I don't need Y. Okay. Um, only because I'm sending in standard scalar here. Oh, but I'm not sending it in here. Is this why?
Okay, at least that fixed that error. But you're saying that we should, probably shouldn't um, send this in here. Um, I know you don't have to, but um, it seemed like it would fit it against the, the testing or the training data rather. But that's fine. I agree. Um, yeah, I had defined name scalar here in the parameter when I was passing it. And actually, let me just get rid of this. It's like obnoxious. Um, but I didn't define it as a function. Thank you. Uh, so that seemed to work, but then we're still getting this error of, here, let's rerun, because I've like totally messed this up again. So let's rerun this, and then let's go ahead and add, that one doesn't need to be rerun. Now let's do this. And let's see if that fixed this. There we go. So what I just did, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry about that. Um, so, okay, I fixed it. <laughs> um, I fixed it. So what I did to fix it was, uh, number one, I forgot to actually send this in as a function. I just sended it, send it, it, it. I just send it, oh my goodness. I just sent it in um, as like the word standard scalar. That's not accurate. So I changed that to sending it in as a function. Um, I did get rid of the Y train here uh, per Pina Colada 11121's <laughs> uh, suggestion. Um, I agree if we just do the fit and transform on the X train because we are going to run it through a model um, to do the fitting to that model with X train and Y train. Oh, and then the other thing that we need to do, obviously, is we need to actually send this in here instead, um, and then also here instead, right? So we're actually scaling it and then um, coming up with it. Okay, so I did that, and then I was still getting the error down here of like, actually I was getting a different error, it was like a recursion error, and I think what was happening there was I had, I needed to clean out my um, uh, data frame, so my ACC, my um, accuracy data frame, I needed to, to like reset it. Okay. So, oh, I'm so sorry that I didn't see your suggestion for brackets earlier. Um, yes, we are passing the function there as a parameter. So let's, let's, um, come back up here. I'm going to redo my data frame. And this is also why I love working in, in, in Jupyter Notebooks because you can rerun cells. And if you haven't noticed already, the cells have these numbers over here. So I can see that the that 43 is the cell that I just ran. And um, I can see that like, for example, this cell here is based off of the data um, from before and not necessarily the data after 43 because this was using, uh, this was run at position 26 and so it's using the old data to display that to that guy and say yes okay so you should be able to see that now okay I think you can hear me I think you can see me um so I think we're okay uh yes I'm gonna say VS code also uh okay so I'm sorry let's just recap super quickly um because I don't think that you saw this but basically what we did was we grabbed uh the standard scalar, we scaled every, we scaled our data, we passed that scaled data into our models instead. Um, and then we added a column to our data frame that was that standard scalar. I'm not gonna go into other ones at the moment. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, we, can, we can do a bar plot of that. So the last thing that we're going to do is something that I'm not super, super, super confident in, but we're gonna try it, okay? This is parameter tuning. Okay, so machine learning models are parameterized so that their behavior can be tuned for a given problem. Okay, so models might have many parameters and finding the best combination of parameters um, is what we is is essentially a search problem. And by finding that best combination of parameters, we'll be able to find the best uh, like way to run through that algorithm in order to get the best accuracy. Um, so every single model has a set of keys called parameters that run them. And each parameter is set to a default value, but it can be changed. And so basically just think about the models as algorithms um, or as, you know, a function and then the parameters as things that can be changed. Okay. Um, because... Every single data set and every question that you might be asking is different. 
that's why we want to have these parameters be able to be changed differently for any kind of data or question that you're asking. So it's not going to be the same across a different data set or a, def a different question that you're asking or anything like that. OK, um, so that's basically what we're going to do. And by uh, kind of doing this parameter tuning or slightly changing the values of those parameters, we're going to narrow down which is the actual best algorithm for the question that we have to ask. So we're going to do this for logistic regression, but there will be some other parameterized parameter tuning um, examples once I post this on the GitHub after the stream. OK, so. Um, Basically, what we're doing is for logistic regression, uh, the logistic model is used to basically classify whether or not something will pass or fail, win or lose, if it's alive or dead, healthy or sick, etc. Um, it can be used to model several classes of events, like whether an image contains a cat, dog, lion, etc. Uh, but basically, it's kind of like a decision between different categories. OK. Um, so each object be, being detected would be assigned a probability between 0 and 1, um, with the sum adding to 1. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to try to um, change some of the, we're going to do, a, we're going to run this through a logistic regression model. Um, we're going to score, our scoring is going to be the accuracy, and we're going to uh, find the best parameters and then find the best score as a result of this, okay? So the here's that here. So the first thing that we're going to do is create a um, dictionary of the parameters. And so this is kind of like that... Uh, Oh gosh, this is where I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting stuck. So, um, uh, tuning, um, right. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to do a search across all of the changes of the parameters in order to, to find the right, uh, the most accurate model. And we're going to use all of the tools that we have in order to do that, OK? Um, so this is a, uh, there's some examples. Again, this is fairly new to me. Um, so the penalty, logistic regression, um, logistic uh, regression. So the logistic regression model on scikit-learn uh, can take in these penalties. And the penalties um, are things that are slightly beyond my understanding. Uh, but let me grab these docs for us really quickly um, and try to understand them a little bit. Uh, where's... Um, penalty L2. So the Newton CG SAG and LBFGS solvers support L2 regularization with primal formulation. OK, I think this is beyond um, beyond the scope of what I'm going to teach you today. Uh, but this is just basically um, the oops, the changes in parameters that were recommended to me by the person who is helping me learn this as well. And so we're going to do perform a grid search. Uh, where we're going to use the logistic regression as the thing that's estimating. And we're going to change the parameters or tune the parameters in the way that's des described above. We're still going to be using the accuracy column as our um, scoring. And CV equals 10 is um, grid search CV um, for scikit-learn. Um, so CV is the cross-validation splitting strategy. Um, so the default is five-fold cross-validation. So I think basically what that's saying is it's cross-validating to make sure that we're not making it worse is what I think is happening. I'm not entirely positive here. This is, again, beyond a little bit of what I what I know. And then we're basically going to fit um, uh, our X train, our training data. 
And then that's going to take a little while, uh, oh, not too long. Um, but but the what we get back is we can actually get to see what the best parameters were. So the best parameter for it was 100 and the best score with that parameter changed. So when, when you set that parameter to 100, that score is 0.884. So for logistic regression, and if we go back above, logistic regression had a 0.875 or 0.8775 when we did um, it with the scaling. And so just by tuning that parameter, uh, we were able to get a score of 0.884. And so we do actually see an improvement um, by tuning that parameter slightly. Um, this is something that they added. Uh, yeah, okay. So then we can actually... Um, do so uh, with logistic regression um, we can actually do a prediction and then get the accuracy score of that and then uh, we get it of 0.87 we can do the same for things like k nearest neighbors again i don't uh, i don't have the time to go into all of these and fully learn them but basically changing some of the parameters for k nearest neighbors as well and finding out what the best um, parameters and then best score of that model here below. So in the best case scenario, um, we get a 0.877 and we can kind of um, when we actually run it, it's actually a little bit lower. But best case scenario is 0.877. And if we look back up at K nearest neighbors, uh, we had a 0.8625. Uh, when we did the scalar, though, it was better than that. So you could also try this by sending in instead of the the um, the test data, you could try it normalized as well. Uh, yeah. So all of this is to say that um, what we did was basically bring in our data, um, take a look at it in different uh, different graph forms. Uh, we were able to determine, you know, good versus bad versus like three through eight. So we just changed it to zero or one. Um, and then we did do the training, uh, splitting the training and testing data, splitting our data between training and testing sets. Uh, we ran it through all of these models here. Oops. Um, and then we compared the accuracy for all of those models, finding that the random forest classifier was the most accurate. Uh, after splitting, or sorry, after normalizing our data, um, we can see that the random forest classifier is still the most accurate at just above 91%, um, but that everything increased with that, just with that standard scalar. So next steps would be to try out different, um, uh, different scalars. And then we also did some exploration of parameter tuning, which uh, is is just like really at the cusp of what I'm understanding so far in, in my machine learning journey. So, um, but we can see that when we do change or tune some of these parameters, we can potentially even get a higher um, accuracy. So 0.884, I'm trying to remember for the, yeah, so that was even better than the standard scalar for logistic regression. But if we looked at the K nearest neighbors, um, it was 0.8774. And um, K nearest neighbors, it was actually better to do the scalar. And so, yeah, trying out different combinations of all of those um, and exploring them. This is where the machine learning SME or subject matter expert comes in. I really appreciate all of the extra education here in the chat. Um, there's so much to learn about machine learning and data science. It's not uh, something that I would consider myself the expert in, but it's something that I'm excited to continue learning. So I appreciate you all jumping in and helping myself and each other. And yeah, I'm going to end it with five minutes to go. Uh, give me time to just plop all of this up on the GitHub repo. And um, I may move those uh, uh, CSV files into a folder um, 
but uh, you can still find them no matter what. You'll be able to find all of our materials at github.com slash Microsoft slash reactors, particularly in the online folder. So that can be found here. Um, and don't forget that this in some way, shape or form with all of the, the small technical difficulties will be up on uh, YouTube by tomorrow. Um, and this is our YouTube channel. So feel free to continue chatting in the chat for a bit as um, you're as there's some questions and such. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm not going to turn my face on just in case the audio goes really loud again. Um, but it's still the same as it was two hours ago. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me. And I can't wait to see what you all um, come up with once it's posted on the YouTube channel. Or if you want, you're welcome to always uh, you know, create an issue as a comment in our GitHub repo, let us know. And if you find out something interesting or, or neat, take it out. Uh, yes, we actually do do these. Um, so these live sessions, we have uh, one pretty much every Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific, Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, and Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific. For reference, this one started at 9 a.m. Pacific today. Um, typically on Thursdays is this style of code with me, uh, two hours long, and the other three are typically an hour long and um, maybe more informational. Sometimes we do like interviews with experts and things like that. Uh, the best way to find out about them right now is to join one of the Microsoft Reactor Meetup pages. Um, you don't have to be in the exact city uh, that the meetup is in because we will be posting some of these digital events. So if you want, you can check out um, all of our reactor meetup pages here. Um, the next one will be Monday. My personal next one, I think, is actually on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific or Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific next week. Um, but you can check out all of our events here. Um, so on that, you can find uh, we have 12 different groups there because, um, yeah, it just kind of referencing all of the ones that we've got. So check out, find the group nearest you, the meetup page nearest you, and um, check that out. And you can also follow us on Twitter where we will also be um, MS Reactor, uh, MSFT Reactor. Sorry, let me grab that link for you. Um, oh my goodness twitter.com slash msft reactor you can also follow us on twitter and we also post those there awesome um great thank you all so much for joining i had a lot of fun with you all today all right i will see you all next week